Welcome, good afternoon. Welcome to LSTM Masterclasses. So today, I, I believe that there are still people joining us. So let me introduce myself. My name is Mafalda Ferreira. I'm Marketing Director of LSTM. And today this is my first master, Masterclass. And today we have here uh, Rui Quinta, co-founder of WIT Company. And for today, he will bring us a very interesting topic. So we will talk about design, but also about the importance of design. So the question is, is design strategic? Um, Rui, let me give you the floor. Go ahead and have a nice session. Just a quick reminder, we will have some Q&A in the end of the session. So please feel free to use your raise hand option in the Zoom. Have a nice session and thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm uh, Paulo and hi everyone. Thanks for the uh, really nice introduction. I just want to say that I'm, you know, every time I see uh, people that I know, I tend to get more nervous, which is a bit strange because I should feel, you know, I should feel at home. So uh, I don't know how to explain this, but let's see how it goes. So I'll take some time to introduce uh, myself and go through the presentation and then like Mahalda said, like in the end we will have some Q&A if you want to take, you know, take notes and questions, anything you want to ask in the end we will do the time for, for that. So I'm going to open the, um, the presentation, there we go. Just give me some feedback, can you, can you see it? Yeah, is it working? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. There we go. Uh, so I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Rui Quinta. Um, I'm a communication designer, uh, but uh, before I was a communication designer, I was also a musician. Uh, this is me uh, in the cover of Journal Blitz. Like it's a really old uh, school um, newspaper in Portugal. And, uh, you know, I, I, sometimes I say that I'm a failed musician because a lot of my friends are very, very known in the musical scene in Portugal, but I ended up, you know, taking other ways, and doing other stuff. So I consider myself a designer. I'm a communication designer. This is my first logo design in 1999. I, uh, I, I draw it by hand. And I had at the time, at the time, I, I had the help of a friend who helped me uh design this properly in autocad which was uh, this like tool for architects so it was a little bit strange that i could you know uh that i could be able to 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 design something uh something like this so i studied communication design and as a designer i was doing a lot of beautiful things i, I fall in love with typography i used to dream with typography which is something that i don't uh, recommend anyone to 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 do and this is, uh, you know, some 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 part of a of a book I designed for for a museum in Lisbon a long time ago. Um, you know, I started. You know, I, I used to design a lot of beautiful things, and uh, at least I thought I, I I was designing a lot of beautiful things, but not knowing to whom or why I was designing these things. So I started investing a lot of time in making more questions, getting to know about strategy, uh, not only developing, you know, logo design, uh, but, you know, going more into branding as, as, the, as the discipline itself of branding. And this is just me experimenting and doing some stuff. I started designing for the web in 2004. It's not something that I've been doing a lot in these uh, last years. Um, but, you know, I've, I've also, um, you know, started doing some stuff for the web a long time ago. I became an entrepreneur pretty early. So I'm going to talk a little bit about all the companies that I've, uh, you know, that I founded in these last uh, years. This is just a piece of an exhibition from one of my companies. And like I said, like I was doing a lot of stuff. Uh, but not making, you know, the right questions and not as many questions as I should. So I decided to, you know, to to sell my first company and i spent around three years just you know just working as a as a freelancer uh, studying uh, strategy spending a lot of time with brand strategists and people who could teach me about um about how to be more curious how to go after stuff how to be more critical uh with the things that i was um designing so after that i also explored video this is just a sample of a video i i did for not just for kids it's a kind of a clothing brand um, a really interesting Portuguese clothing brand. And, you know, I can, in the end, I think I consider myself a creative uh, and adaptive uh, creative uh, that, you know, tries to fit in, in every situation um, that, you know, that steps into my way. 
in this search for, you know, for meaning and for purpose in my work and the things that I did, I ended up discovering um, the D school in, at the HPI Academy in Potsdam, close to Berlin. And I, in 2011, I, I moved to Berlin and I was there studying for one year, uh, also with this guy, which is George Kimball, um, to study design thinking, which is an innovation process. It's a way of looking at design. Um, it's a mindset. It's a process. I'm not uh, going to discover that uh, to discuss that in this point of the presentation. But we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. And um, you know, and I and I felt pretty good about about this year. You know, it taught me a lot as a designer. I could design businesses. I could design services, products, uh, systems. I could think beyond the aesthetics, you know, beyond the aesthetic output of my uh, of my work as a designer, and that was really really powerful at the time. So, and today I consider, and to finish this initial presentation, I consider myself a design performer. Uh, basically, what I'm doing right now with you is, you know, trying to inspire you, trying to show something, you know, from my work, from the things that I do and I, that my companies uh, produce. I, I, I really try to, you know, to teach people and to share my knowledge and to share everything that I've learned in these last years. Uh, so I, you know, I'm a professor at um, some, some business schools and also uh, the Faculty of Fine Arts in the city of Lisbon. So, and all of this actually happened after, you know, this experience in Potsdam at the Hassel Plattner Institute, uh, where um, I think it was funny to see that we were let, that we were only 16 designers uh, among 170 people in that specific year, meaning that, you know, we are in this, I was in a design school in a course called design thinking, but actually, you know, but we were less than 10%, you know, like people who, who had a degree in design. So, but this is part of the, of the fun. This is part of the poetics of, of, of being in this context is actually being surrounded by engineers, being surrounded by people like neuroscientists or psychologists or psycho or uh, sociologists or, you know, people from really, really uh, different backgrounds that, that, than I had at the time. So it was really powerful be, to be able to create and to generate projects and ideas for specific project partners like DHL, uh, Jensen and Jensen, you know the 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 Ministry of of um, of Defense uh, in 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 Germany, the Municipality of Brandenburg, like really really real clients that would give us these challenges, and we were working, we were had to work on those challenges for for some months, and that's where I met uh, Tiago. So Tiago is today my partner at with Company, and I think it's interesting if you look at the date in this. Uh, in this slide, there's like 15 of March, 2012. So we are celebrating uh, 10 years. So it's more than 10 years now. Uh, you can still find us and these videos and, and everything we did for a specific project documented in fishingforideas.wordpress.com. And what we did was, you know, this was already uh, a long time ago. And it was about 10 years. It was really fun. And like I told you, like we were developing these projects at the D school. We were developing projects for real project partners, but we didn't know uh, what happened to those ideas. Like what, what happened to everything that we produced? Because basically we would deliver these, um, these products, these, uh, these solutions, but there was no follow up uh, from, uh, you know, from the side of the, of the school. There was no follow up from, from the teams. So we never knew if this would actually work in the real world. So I think this was the question, the most important question. Like, even if you you study, um, you know, some of these innovation processes or uh, design processes, like for a short period of time, you will always ask this question: like, will this work? You know, the, this, these things that I'm learning are they going to impact the real world? And we were there studying for one year, and we decided to actually, you know, not going and teach others how to do it, but we decided to work based on those principles, based on those values, based on the things that we've learned. So we took three months of our lives to help a company that it was in really, really bad shape for about 10 years. So we took time to, to actually help them. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you that story. So we call this project Fishing for Ideas. Again, like you can, you can it's, it's really, really naive. Like I think you, you, you'll probably laugh a little a little when you go through these uh, posts because it's really interesting like to see how we think and how we thought our thought processes 10 years ago and how we take decisions every framework that we used every thing that we did along along the way so i'm going to talk to you about this wholesale company they were drowning for about 10 years they were in really really bad shape and they are a wholesale company but they also had 
um, not only the, beyond the wholesale market and business, they had a fish stand in a local market in Lisbon, not in Lisbon, in a, in a city close uh, to Lisbon, and also a fish shop uh, in, a, in a store um, also uh, near, near Lisbon. So just for you to have an idea that they're not only talking and selling business to business, but also selling business to consumers. So there was this kind of big network of, of stakeholders that we had to analyze, that we had to go through. So as designers, um, like, and as people with experience in a certain field, we tend to take the things that we know, right? So, you know, I know how to design a website. So let me sell you a website. I know how to design a brand. Let's let me sell you a new brand, a rebranding for your project. You know, I know a few things about automation. Can I do something with this? And I think in this context, we're talking about an SME. So it's a, like a medium company. Uh, they had around 20 people at the time and their needs were not an online platform to sell more fish or an app or a, a rebranding of their company or, you know, let's look at some numbers and try to figure out how to use these numbers to help your business. Like these are people who are working there, some of them for more than 20 years. They don't have a clue on what this means, like to be honest. At that point, they didn't have a clue uh, of what any of these words mean. So this doesn't mean anything for them. Like it was more challenging for us and for them to actually uh, first try to understand what the problems were and not trying to sell them anything up front. So they needed help. I think this is like a stupid slide that I have in this presentation that actually sums up pretty well, you know, the needs of this client. They were in such a moment that they just needed help in that specific point, at that specific point. They needed someone who could look at all the aspects of their business. And I think for me, this is one of the most important slides. Uh, you know, they needed someone to help them reconnect with their purpose. What happens inevitably when you sit together with someone, when you, when you gather people around the table to talk about problems, to talk about what's happening, to talk about potential solutions, to map everything and the kind of these historical moments that the company had throughout these 26 years of existence at the time. This is what happens, you know, like people start thinking again on why they are going to work. This sounds pretty strange, but if you work in the same place for more than three years, four years, and maybe I'm exaggerating in this specific moment, maybe it's like six months, you start to re-question, you know, like to question why you are going to work every, every day. What's, you, what's the purpose of waking up in the morning, right? So when we have these discussions, we actually help these people, you know, rethink or, or, or on the motives that, that, you know, make them go out of bed and, and, and go to work in the morning. That's beautiful. That's something beautiful. And it doesn't matter if it's a startup with three people, you know, that it's uh, trying to make it for three years or if it's a, like an SME or if it's a huge corporation, it doesn't matter. Like typically this is what happens when you put people around the table and bring them with you in this uh, journey. So this is what we did for about three months. Like we, uh, we try to listen a lot, right? So again, like I told you, there was a lot of stakeholders. So we, we made this really, really, we sketched a plan for the three months that we were going to work with them. And we jumped straight to the, to the sea. We went to a port in Peniche talk, uh, to talk with fishermen, you know, to try to understand how do they, you know, take the fish from the sea and how do they sell the fish and how does that specific moment happens uh, in the context of the business. So we listen a lot, like we got to know the history of this company, like uh, this is an image, like the first image is Tiago kind of mapping, um, like the business decisions that they took, you know, like the, the types of products that they will sell at a certain moment in time, how many people they had, the financial curve of the company and the, you know, this healthy or not so healthy, like you see in, the, in that last moment of, uh, of, the, of the financial condition of the, of the company. And some of the main core uh, changes that happen in, in the context of the business itself. Um, so this is what we did in this first moment. And then, you know, when we talk about these things, like we talk a lot about understanding people, right? Understanding behavior, understanding uh, who, who uh, to whom are we designing these things? Like not only their clients, but our, so our specific client, you know, really trying to understand their struggles, like their everyday struggles. So when we, when people, typically people talk about empathy, right? You know, like having the ability of step on someone else's shoes, trying to feel what they feel, 
but if we have, if we have, if if we try to feel what they feel, we have to be there. Like we have to uh, to actually work with them. You know, like uh, this is what we did for two or three nights. Like we were there working with them, gloves on, not shoes on, but gloves on, working with these people. Try to understand how would they communicate with uh, within uh, you know their team between the members of the team. How how would they uh, show the product to the clients? How would they interact with the client? You know, like uh, understanding distribution, understanding communication. There was a lot of aspects, uh, and we could all that we could only understand by actually being there with them. So, in this process, we don't stick with the obvious, right? So we want to search like we are in a in a stage where we just want to. We have this huge appetite for information, right? We need to understand everything around this business. So. We took the empathy to an extreme point and we ate fish for three months, uh, like a lot. Like we, we ate more fish for three months because every time we would go to a restaurant or cook at home, we wanted to understand how do we pick the fish? How do we, you know, how do we order the fish in a restaurant? What type of fish, you know, do restaurants at that specific channel uh, sells, et cetera. Like we looked at, you know, food trends. We talked with a lot of experts because we don't have all the knowledge that's something that we have to bear in mind. Like we have to talk with a lot of people because, you know, they can bring a lot of, uh, of, of important information for the discussion. And I can tell you a really, really short story about this first image that you have there. That's the lady. We were doing this observation in a, in a local market in Lisbon. And we saw this lady putting fish in a bag, inside a bag, and leaving her stand, a working stand. And she, she just left the market. And we were like, we were just curious. It was like, why, why is she doing this? Why is she leaving her working stand, working place, and 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 moving away? From, you know, and where, where is she going? And we use this incredible technique called uh, shadowing, um, which basically means that we stalk this person for about uh, I don't know for about one kilometer. It was about one kilometer. She walked into a neighborhood. Uh, she went into this neighborhood in Lisbon, and we just saw what happened. She. Uh, she she went inside of a grocery shop and she gave the bag full of fish to an old lady and that old lady gave her money. And this happened, this transaction happened inside of a grocery shop that was owned by uh, Dona Lourdes. It's the lady that owned the shop was called Dona Lourdes. And she allowed this transaction to happen in her own space, which I think it's just, uh mind-blowing i think at the time we was just like what's happening here is this normal and i think roger martin like if you want to dig into uh some writings about the business uh, about business design about strategy about strategic design uh you should have a look uh on on the books uh, wrote uh, wrote by roger martin and he talks about something interesting called abductive reasoning which is relatable with the idea of inference, right? So you, we are creative, right? So we can guess things. So what we did at this point was thinking, you know, what can we guess from this, right? What, what, can, what happened here? So we just thought, okay, there's, you know, there's demand. There's someone looking for fish in that specific part of the city, which is the old lady. You know, there's someone who needs to sell fish there's someone who, who abandons her working uh, station to, to just go one kilometer and, and deliver fish. Uh, and, there's, and there must be confidence between all these people for this to happen inside and in front of the owner of that local market, of that local grocery shop. So we thought maybe Dona Lourdes, the owner of the, of the grocery shop, never uh, sold uh, fish in in her life. Otherwise, she wouldn't be uh, allowing for this to happen in her own space. And maybe she has loads of confidence with these people in her neighborhood to allow this thing to happen. But I'm going back to this story in a minute. So from these observations, from the interviews, from everything that we did, we also did surveys. We have to make sense of this information, right? So we try to make everything visible. We love the word redundancy uh, because, like, we have to go through the information loads uh, lots of times so that we can you know, crystallize, like it, 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 it becomes part of our memory, it becomes part of our brain, like it helps us take decisions throughout the, the, the length of the project. And we did a lot of analysis, right, based on the information, like what you see on the right, there's Tiago with a stakeholder map on his back, there's uh, like a, 
a, a funny prototype of a journey map of the distribution system for that company. You know, these matrices are us evaluating the competition and, and basically, you know, this is, we, we just try to make everything visible uh, in, in our way of understanding what we have in front of us. Let me just ask one thing, uh, Mafalda, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, we started, at what time did we start it? I'm just trying to, we started at? 5.30. 30, okay, so, okay. Just for me to control the time. Okay, good. Um, so, and after this, like we take all of this information, we, we, this information becomes knowledge, right? So it helps us take decisions, you know, we find insights that we open up our minds for ideas and we start solving the problem. And it's not that we wait for, you know, like two months so that we can start having ideas. Like this is a human process, right? So we can have an idea in the first day of the project. And I think that's a misconception about, you know, the process of design is that you have to wait for that. You have to wait for prototyping. You have to wait for, you know, uh, for, for having ideas. Like we, we had ideas every day. And some of these ideas were prototyped in the first week or second week of the project and tested in the first or second week of the project. And one of those ideas, you can see, uh, you can see them in, in that post-it. So going back to the lady of the grocery shop and that whole story that I told you, we just thought, well, why don't we use like, We can ask Lourdes, we can ask this lady if she wants to sell fresh fish in that grocery shop. So we went there and we asked Lourdes, like, Lourdes, would you like to sell fish? Like you gain a percentage out of everything that you sell. You don't need to have a fridge here because we can bring you, you know, everything. We can put a fridge here for you. You just have to take the orders and, you know, and people ask you what they want. And she said, of course, yeah, let's try to do it. You know, so we did a poster, like uh, the first idea, it's a, it's a, that post, that shitty post that you see there. And then we just did this poster. We asked an illustrator, a friend of ours, to go there and design Lourdes' uh, face. And we designed this poster saying, fresh fish, ask Lourdes. It was not fresh fish, ask us, you know, this company who sells fish and that has to explain what it does. Like it wasn't, you know, we're not talking about us. Like, you want a fresh fish, you talk with Lourdes. So after a couple of weeks, after two weeks, we were selling 600 euros of fish. After a month, we were selling a few thousand euros. After some years, it represented around 20% of their uh, income. We're talking about a company that sells a couple of million euros uh, per year. We are not only talking about this specific store. We are talking about opening up a new channel of distribution, a new channel for people to order their fish. And this was the first wholesale company 10 years ago, we actually used local grocery shops, small supermarkets in Oeiras, Amadora, and Lisbon as points of sales and distribution. And I think this is just beautiful. And it started with, you know, like a really naive observation with us being curious about things, being critical about, about things, going after things, and actually prototyping and testing really, really early in the, in the, in the process. And the only aesthetical output actually in the whole process was this poster that I think it's amazing and iconic uh, for us at this, uh, after 10 years, I, I see this and, and I love it. I still love it. So uh, in these, like in these things and coming up with a conclusion for this, um, we're also talking about human centered design, right? So we talk about looking at behavior, looking at people, looking at how people behave. And we invented the new stakeholder in this whole process, right? So we had to consider you know, the grocery shops and how would they fill the orders? Because taking an order of fish, it's more difficult than you think. Like you have to think about the client, the type of fish, the quantity, if it's big, if it's small, you know, if it's uh, uh, like uh, the whole thing, if it's sliced, whatever, if like how you're going to cook it, like you have to ask these questions. So it's difficult. So we designed this really, really stupid form that they had on the wall. And every time someone called or entered the store, they would take notes so that they don't forget anything that they have, need to ask. And then they would photograph and send to us so that we could actually fill the orders and then deliver the next day. So human centered design is maybe considering a new stakeholder and making things easier to adopt, right? So we have to understand, we have to design for uh, based on behavior. And then I make this kind of step, um, Because we, we consider a lot, of, a lot of things beyond Dona Lourdes at that point. 
but also we should consider today everything that we learned after these 10 years you know like you have to des- have to design not only for people you have to consider things around you and i think the concept of systemic design like brings you that you know like you have to consider relations you have to consider like a bigger picture you have to consider the us not only the you know that specific person uh, and you have to consider the impact of every decision that you take i'm going to talk about a, a sentence that we love and that we use a lot that talks a lot about this impact of every decision like everything we uh, we decide will impact other people and and today at with company we consider ourselves transformative by design and transformative design is a subset of the discipline of design right so we consider the politics of power when we take decisions you know the power or the lack of it and the last sentence we have to consider what you cannot control so we design things to be transformative like we design the nodes and we give power to the people to actually move those handles right so it's like you as a graphic designer for example i don't know if there's graphic designers in the in the room but if you're designing like some something with vector you can move these handles you have the power to move the, the these handles right so in big systems in big companies in big um systemic projects like you really uh, sometimes like you have to deal with the fact that you have to deliver power and live with the fact that things are going to change uh you know considering the shape of time okay so uh a little you know uh, shortcuts to this um this way of seeing design uh from human centered designs to systemic design to transformative design going back to the project like what were we able to deliver in the end so optimize processes of management and communication we play a lot with the fact that we say that we re- rose the number of meetings in 100% because these people were not meeting they they were taking unilateral decisions like they were not meeting to talk and to discuss problems they were not doing you know th- the things that needed to be done at that time um so we identify new channels like i think i've talked about this it was not the only one like we, we designed a specific team to actually go after uh, the channel oreca uh, it's go after you know restaurants and hotels so that they could sell also in that specific uh, context and market so we designed the team to actually be able to do that and they've grown a lot also in that uh, in that uh, specific part and we were able 6 months after the project so 9 months after the project started uh, started they had reduced their debt in 2/3 and this is this is brutal this is brutal not only because we were able to find new channels of, uh, of sales like try to you know to sell more fish and to to make them uh, the the business healthier but we actually designed a team uh, to do some negotiation because what happens a lot in small companies is that you sell a lot right you, you you as a company like you there's a lot of info invoices going out but the money doesn't come in so um so there you don't have money to manage the company basically so basically they they got the money back uh because this this team was you know every day was calling their their clients and you know talking about the importance of actually you know them paying back the money so they kind of uh you know they 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 got this healthier uh company after after 9 months and i think that was that was just uh inspiring at the time. So a few learnings like what have we learned? I don't know if you remember at the beginning I was asking uh you know will it work uh, in the real world? You know like to look at design from this perspective like to bring other people into the discussion um to work with the client not for the client like involving the client along the way. And I would say that it works at least you know these conclusions like for us it works and it's loads of work like it's an emotional roller coaster it's totally different from you working alone thinking alone uh you know magic, managing your stuff you have to manage a team of people who think differently who think different than you who come from a different background than you and this is an emotional roller coaster it starts with you and your team and then expands to your client because you are bringing your client and your client's fears so it's loads of work right the second thing is that it's more about people than the process when we talk about design it doesn't matter if it's you know design thinking human centered design systemic design you know everybody talks about design being a process or design being a methodology right it doesn't matter like it's both i don't want to enter that discussion but for me it's more about being predisposed to work like this 
Like you have to believe that, you know, it's important to work like this. So for me, it's about being predisposed uh, to be a designer, to think like a designer, to move like a designer, to act like a designer. And the third thing is that company culture depends on the conditions. So we got to know a lot about organizational culture from this particular project. But then you got, we got to know a lot from the company culture we wanted for our companies. Because me and Tiago, like this was working pretty well. And we just imagine if one day we will open a company, it will be based on these principles. You know, we, we will have these conditions. And um, we, got, we just got to know that what you give to your people is actually what you get back, right? And the fourth thing, and you know, connecting to the to the name of the presentation uh, that I'm doing right now, is that design is strategic, and it's strategic not only when we think about the word uh, from, you know, from this organic context that things just happen to be, and ideas come out of nowhere. There's no work behind it. There's no thought process behind it. There's no intention behind it, and that's, you know, it's a balance between those those things. Uh, it's a balance between, you know, finding things because we diverge. And, you know, I tell my teams, like, if you're stuck, just go outside, buy a magazine of golf and go read about golf, you know, like go read about something else, you know, and then I'm being intentional about being organic. I don't know if, uh, you know, if people just like, you know, imagine people at my at my company, they just, you know, make fun of me because I'm always talking about the word organic and trying to make things easy for, for everyone. So. And design is strategic, not, not only allowing us to intentionally design important things for clients, like I showed you in this example, like we did at D-School and before that, but allowing us to critically explore and design for the impact we want to have. And of course, we can do that by also helping clients, also work with clients, also be with clients, like being with them, growing with them. But, you know... Uh, but, you know, designing, uh, designing our own things, you know, and the sentence I was talking about uh, previously, it was what we care for is everyone's business. Like this, you, you cannot ignore the decisions that you take. Um, every time we take a, decisions, we, a decision, we are not impact. We are impacting our teams, our people. Uh, you know, the people around us, our organizations, society, everything around, right? So I think we have to be considerate uh, about this and critical about everything that we, that we decide um, in any project. So these are not my businesses. They are everyone's businesses. And it happened to, you know, I just happened to take shape in them. I think this is a little bit poetic because there's loads of work and there's loads of discussions and there's loads of... Um, you know, problems that we have to solve every day. But I really think this happens this way. Like I, uh, they learn from me. I learn from them. Like I've been growing with them. And it's just inspiring to, to have people around you that can actually uh, make you better. And, and I feel that, like, to be honest, I feel that. So I've been designing my own companies and being part of the design of my own companies since, you know, uh, 2006. These are uh, some, some companies that I still own so and founded. So a uh, company uh, called Toino.com. Uh, we are a space experience design studio. We design exhibitions for science museums. Uh, we design experiences in space. And uh, we, we design office spaces. We've done so many incredible stuff in the last 10 years, uh, not only in Portugal, but you know, Germany, um, uh, China, Finland, France, uh, like in really, really, really cool work. So we have the spin-off from with company called Double W, where we were thinking like we are becoming too expensive. So how can we redesign our process? How can we design our approach so that we can still design things and be strategic um, when we work with startups and have kind of a lower price point so that we can still work with them? So we have this company called Double W, which does branding for starting companies. I am a founder of something called Peixeria Centenaria, which closed its doors in the end of last year because we were exhausted, exhausted. There's a connection to the project I've shown you. I'm not going to tell that story today, but it was just beautiful. And we have to celebrate the existence of this business that, you know, that fulfilled so many orders and so many people who, who wanted to know about us, who wanted to eat, you know, our, our, our 
our products. And it was just a beautiful business to run that closed its stores uh, in the end of last year, after eight, more than eight years. And with company, I've told you about we are transformative design, uh, transformative by design. And this is, uh, you know, this is, this is our office here, our headquarters uh, in Lisbon. So small break, I'm finishing, last slides. Uh, I'm on time. Wow, this is, this is yes, this is incredible. but I would like you to talk a little bit more about Peixaria Centenaria because last time we talked, you were closing the project, and it's a very interesting project. And we have students here from marketing and design as well. So, if you could share just a couple of minutes, just explaining. <laughs> we would I... love but I don't know. You you manage your time with the presentation. Go ahead, and in the end, if we have the yeah. time. Yeah, let's see if I can if I can find some time uh, in the end. Even after questions, like for people who want to stay, yeah. I, I think I can add like a couple of slides to yeah. to the presentation. Just like you know, I have a slide saying enough about fish <laughs> because I think we talked too much. If I, would, <laughs> if I would share other twenty slides talking about fish, I think that would be too much. But we can leave that to the end, and I will be yeah. totally um, okay with me to share with with, with you. So enough about fish. Let's talk about time and the matter called today. So. Uh, what I mean by this is just, you know, kind of a jump to, to some end slides where I talk about uh, not the conditions, but the principles behind our work. And, you know, we'll briefly mention other projects we've done in the last 10 years. And how do we look at these principles, how these principles that we've learned from the experience of the last 10 years, we will have different principles in 10 years for sure. What I'm saying is that these are influenced by everything we did until now, until this particular point. And, and sometimes I even think they, they are a little bit uh, outdated already. So, but still, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share them with you, these design principles. So at, with company, we design from people, right? So we, we look at behavior, like we, you saw that in a, in a project. This is just a short example where we did a project for the Portuguese government, for the Ministry of Culture, where we ended up designing an algorithm, but we started by looking at people's behavior in a rural context in the north of Portugal, like being there with people on the field, talking with them, understanding their pains about the territory, about their land. Uh, and in the end, like the output was something totally different. What I'm saying here is that um, uh, we should consider everything, right? But we design from people and from their behavior. Uh, so design the ways it's uh, actually mentions the future, like we are, when we are being speculative about what we design, you know, when we are doing projects that point towards the future, uh, when you come up with technologies, when you come up with these solutions that are really far fetched, really ahead, uh, you have to understand that there has to be like a roadmap, a road, a, a plan for you to get there, because sometimes people don't grasp what you are designing in that particular moment. And you have to be considerate about that. Like you have to understand that that thing uh, really, really, really happens most of the time. So you have to design not only the solution, but the way for us to get there. And then design the middle. Uh, I think it relates a lot with the idea of systems, right? With the idea um, of systemic design, with the idea of transformative design, which is this huge amount of information, this huge amount, this, like this big complexity uh, around solving uh, complex problems. And we are, as designers, we are in the middle. And that's beautiful. It's really hard, but it's beautiful. But I, as, as a, like a really, really sharp example of what also design the middle can mean is this project we did for José de Mel Saúd, uh, which is uh, like a hospital uh, in, in uh, Kuf Hospital here in, in Portugal. And we were asked to design the doctor's office of the future. And what design the middle means in this context is that you are designing for two totally different personas that will live in the same space. And how, how incredible is this? Like, how do you solve this? And sometimes you have to design even more complex things. But if you think about something simple as a, a doctor's office, right? Yeah, the, the two people who sit there to talk, they, have, they feel different things. They know different things. They have different postures and attitudes. And this is just beautiful. How do you design a room to fit both um, both needs, right, of uh, these two different people. So another one is designed from ingenuity. Like we had the, the naivete enough to, to go after that, you know, the fish lady to understand what she was doing, right? So we look at these like small details. We get curious about the things that make us feel things. Uh, a lot of people try to explain what an insight is. 
it's difficult for me after so many years to explain what an insight is, you know, beyond the fact that it, you know, like I get goosebumps or, you know, it's something that makes me laugh. It's something that triggers my attention. Uh, I find it difficult to explain beyond this, you know, like to find kind of a proper mode of explaining what an insight is, but it's something that stimulates my curiosity that makes me think maybe this is why, you know, makes me think, why is this happening? So we design from ingenuity. Like we really try to pay attention, um, try to be aware of the unaware. I think that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. So we design with everyone, meaning that we involve everybody in the process. Uh, we were designing this strategy for the, community of Lisbon's and like the Lisbon's entrepreneurial echo scene in Lisbon some times ago. And we involved, you know, like people from the municipality, investors, uh, co-workers, uh, um, owners, founders, everyone in the design process to come up with a brand, with a new platform and with a, with, um, with a strategy for, for them. And it was also pretty fun and it teached us a lot. And again, like we really try to involve everyone in the process. Not only, this is something that you have to retain, not only in the research stage, right? At the beginning where you are making questions, but it's really hard to involve people when you have to take decisions, like bringing them to the decisions to take decisions with you, you know? Uh, for example, in this, in this project, we were doing a branding, like we were doing a brand, right? And we asked people, What's the color you imagine that can better represent this ecosystem? You know, what's, what's the type of type that you think it fits, you know, the kind of this attitude that the city has, you know, uh, on, uh, on the people who live there and create businesses from there. So it's really, really interesting to, to think about these things. And the last one, it's design inconsistency. So the last principle, I think it's uh, the most difficult uh, to explain but I think I can, I can just tell you this brief story. We were doing a project for X-Team. X-Team is this uh, multinational uh, game development, software development company based in Australia. They have hundreds of co uh, workers and people, and developers around the world. 90% of their workforce works remotely. And we work with them for, you know, since uh, 11 years uh, before with company existed. And we did a project five years ago for them. And what we realized was, uh, they asked us to work on their culture. Like, how can we create a culture when 90% of our workforce is not here? They're not meeting. They're not bumping into each other uh, and a coffee machine, right? This ideal uh, that we have about uh, working in a space. And, uh, and what, we, what, what we found uh, was something pretty interesting, which was something that probably almost everyone here felt in the last two years, which was, it's really like a really interesting idea to work remotely. Uh, it seems that you can do everything with your time. You can do whatever you want. You can work at any time that you want. But what happens inevitably to most people that we talked with was that people tend to get depressed. You know, they get depressed because they are not able to break their patterns. You know, they are not able to go outside and bump into someone unexpectedly. They are not able to going, you know, they're not, it's not that they're not able, they don't find the motivation to go after those things. Like they don't find the strength anymore to go out and do things. And I think it's a really poetic idea, but in the end, this is what we uh, came out with. Like we have to find ways, find mechanisms, cultural mechanisms to break the pattern, to create inconsistencies in the way that these people uh, were living their work. And I think, I think this is an interesting, because uh, it's an interesting thing because it can inspire us to do this in other projects. And when I talk about transformative design, I talk about, you know, unexpectedness. I talk about dealing with things that we cannot control, but actually if we are able to design, you know, if we're able to design uh, in a way or to predict the things that we cannot control, we are actually designing inconsistencies. We are designing things who are not that predictable based on you know, the fact that we get to the end, uh, understanding that we are more predictable than we think. This was a bit strange, but I will mention Dan Ariely saying that Dan Ariely is a, a, behavioral and economy, a behavioral economist and he talks about the fact that we are uh, predictably irrational. So we are irrational. I think we are inconsistent in a way. Uh, but we can predict a little bit, you know, those inconsistencies.
um, I will show you this video again. Uh, I will show you a, a, like a, a small video just to, to make case for what I'm saying right here. And some of you probably know already this product. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for our client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Okay, so what I say here is, uh, what I try to, uh, when I show you this, is that uh, that was a robot, right? So it's a robot uh, full of nuances. So it's not as predictable, as mechanical, as, it's, like, it's not like a metronome, right? Because we are not like metronomes. Like, you know, I have nuances in the way I say things, and I'm not, uh, not always using the same pitch in my voice to express what I'm saying, right? So they are mimicking that. Uh, the way they do that, uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it would be an interesting topic for a future conversation. Uh, but it's interesting because they are designing inconsistencies, right? So they are taking uh, us as an example uh, to fool ourselves. Um, and I don't know if that's beautiful. Like I have this thing about not knowing if this is beautiful and interesting, or if it's just like the scariest thing ever that we can do with design. But Still, welcome to the future because um, it's going to be scary and welcome to the present because it's already happening. So thank you for your attention. Yep, I think I'm a little bit over time, but it's okay. No, but it's perfect. So now we have, uh, we have some time for questions. So it's expected to finish, as, uh, to finish at 5.30. So we have here around 10 minutes for everyone to ask the questions uh, you may want to ask to Rui. We have here some students, as I was saying, from our BAs in marketing and design, and also some students from the masters, and I believe some future students as well. I don't know if you want to start asking questions. I was seeing a comment from Jack Sanders, but it's to all the people that are attending the session but i have a question for you Hui. so yep. and with company you're not all, only helping companies uh, with design matters but you are also helping companies to uh, transform their um, culture and to introduce change in companies can you can you share some examples of works uh, you have done and I have a second question as well. I, I will take the time to, 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 to ask as well this. Uh, can design help us to build a culture, an organi organizational culture as well? Mm -hmm. And now we have one question in the chat box. Let me just okay. check from Jack Sanders. Do you often look into business strategy when creating design strategies? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start um, uh, by answering your uh, questions like quick, uh, quickly, Mafalda. So, yeah, I can give you a, a couple of examples. Um, one, I think it's simple, was the 
a company with around uh, 70 people. They had offices in uh, South Africa. They had offices in, uh, in two places here in Portugal. And they, are, they were uh, an environmental consultancy agency. Mm -hmm. And they were really, really formal in the way they did things. So we brought the design mindset. We brought, uh, you know, like this proactiveness and um, dedication to the, to, and we designed, you know, like a program with them for uh, about six months where we actually transformed the way they took decisions, uh, you know, we redesigned the way they shaped their teams uh, to design projects and to deliver projects. And it was, it was something, uh, really, really cool to, to do. Uh, it was some time ago already. Uh, recently, we've been uh, doing that with Fidelidad, which is the, the biggest, uh, like the biggest um, insurance company in Portugal. We are, we were first uh, kind of doing this, um, this um, diagnostic on their culture, trying to actually like define what their culture was, you know, like crossing that with, you know, the, 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 the leaders in the company, you know, crossing that with the values that they already had established and talking a lot with people from, you know, uh, every part of the company trying to create this alignment on what the culture and the uh, expected behaviors uh, were. And it's been a project that, you know, lasts for four years now. Uh, it had lots of complexity because we are acting in different levels, not only with the, with the people related with uh, HR and people um, uh, and people, and organization, but also other areas like innovation in the company, like trying to bring all of these pieces uh, together. So I think these are um, uh, two uh, two examples that I can give you about the. Uh, so you can design culture, yes, you can design culture, you can design mechanisms, and you can design uh, ways for people to take decisions. And the 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 other question about business, uh, sure. Uh, it's it, like we we cannot do it uh, without looking at the business, and it's interesting because it's something that we say at least for, uh, with company like we say that from the beginning like uh, we always lacked someone actually from a from a, a business background because I think it would be pretty pretty helpful. Tiago has a design management background that helps a lot like he's really structured. He gets to know in, in depth uh, in depth uh, you know like the uh, the aspects of you know uh, of the business on on the client side. But we have to know, we have to make as much questions as we can. We cannot ignore that. Like you have to look at the business, you have to look at the brand, you have to look at the communication, you have to look at a lot of layers uh, in, the, in the context of the project, of course, uh, but we always look at the business, yes. Yes, and now we have here a comment from Ines. She doesn't have a question, but she would like to share. Uh, that it was a pleasure to hear some of your projects or with company thank projects. Thank you. Well, thanks. And also a question from, I, I believe I'm going to say the name correctly, Haeza Hamed Kasim. <laughs> uh, so, um, how would you develop the trust between you and a client so that they trust you through the whole process? Because sometimes a client tells you exactly what they want. Yeah um and how would you get them to be more open to transformative design hmm. it's a trust issue or a trust yeah. relation right yeah i think uh, i think you have to bring them uh, you have to be a little bit political in that so i i, I recommend a book wrote by Ezio manzini that it's uh, i think it's called politics of the everyday like I think we as designers have to be a little bit have to know more about politics. Uh, <laughs> you have to bring them in the to the to your process. Like if your process is, uh, you know, let me see if you're right. So it's not it's not going against them, but it's asking the question. I will see if you're right. Okay, I will validate that suggestion as if it was a prototype. In a way, that's a design probe, right? The client is telling you, I want something like this. That's a design probe. You go and you see if it works or not, and you bring them to that discussion by presenting other design probes, other solutions, other potential solutions. So if you don't only show him one thing, but you show him two or three things, you know, and you can you can guide this person, um, uh, in, 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 and you can have a discussion, you can have a conversation for you to see which of these solutions is actually the best. Sometimes you can be wrong. Sometimes you as a designer, some, sometimes the client is presenting something that, you know, based on his feelings, on his experiences, it's, it's actually going to work. 
Uh, and sometimes because he knows the business better. Yeah, because he knows the business. So what I'm saying is that probably most of the times you will come up with something that you feel that it's more proprietary, that it comes out of uh, out of your out of your process, out of uh, out of your way of doing things. Uh, but but you know, sometimes I think it's really like talking about graphic design. What's the the name of the guy from Pentagram? Uh, uh, help me. In, Inez, are you, are you there? What's the name of the guy from? Uh, I don't know if Inez is there. Um, yeah, yeah. There's. I don't remember. I don't remember the name of the guy. But there's one of the founders, uh, Pentagram. He's probably one of the most experienced people in the world designing brands. Uh, and he says, you know, I have doubts. You know, there's moments where I don't know which is the best solution. So I take all of these solutions. I sit with my client and I talk with them. You know, I talk with my client. Uh, it's not Alan Fletcher. No, uh, it's another one. Um, don't gosh. worry. I'm searching. Yeah, I will, I will, think I will give you the name. In... <laughs> yeah. uh, it's uh, Michael Birut. Sorry. It's Michael Birut. Um, it's Birut. But Alan Fletcher is also there. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's I mean, It was know. founded by Alan Fletcher, Theo Crosby, Colin Forbes. Yeah, Birut is not one of the founders, right? Like he kind of joined the team in an early stage and he's kind of one of the big faces today in Pentagram, I think. Okay. Um, and we have here more questions. Sorry, I interrupt you with the name. No, it's okay. So from Daniel. Hey, Rui, my question is about ethnographic research. With all that that has been going on in the last two years, have you been using more digital tools to observe, interact, and interview people? How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I think we had to redesign a bunch of things in the last two years, right? So, for example, I think we question ourselves. Uh, we question our ability to be able to do that. Uh, and then we were even kind of pushed a little bit by the clients, like saying, yeah, yeah, you can do it. Of course you can do it. It's interesting because it seemed like we we were questioning ourselves too much. And we ended up uh, in that process, uh, like designing the new uh, pos uh, positioning and strategy for uh, like probably one of the biggest olive oil brands in the world. And we did it, it, like everything was done remotely in a digital context. Like all the workshops we did were organized online. All the interviews was, were online. Uh, we were able to redesign tools and things that we had in the physical world and take that into, um, I don't know, Miro, Miro, uh, and, and actually engage with clients. Like we discovered a lot of things, you know, it's really hard for you to be one day sitting at a computer in a workshop. It's really, really hard. Like you cannot get people attention. Uh, people's attention uh if you do that but um but uh yeah but yes but we 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 used it and we used it successfully i would say like the results are are, are pretty good the results of the projects are still pretty good are you good i can't hear you mafalda uh, Sorry, I was just checking if we have more questions in the chat box. We don't have, and we are almost reaching our time, but I have a final question for you. What is your inspiration, your everyday inspiration? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think... I think today I consider myself a generalist. Uh, you know, I'm a, I have a background in design, but... Uh, you know, my books are about geology, are about birds, are about uh, the planets, are about our impact, are about psychology, are about neurosciences, which is one of my favorite topics ever. And I tend to, I, I tend to look at my inspiration as being um, always something that I don't know that stimulates me, you know, like this is really hard to live with, to be honest. Uh, because I will always feel, you know, it's not like I'm 20 anymore. I'm still making these questions. I'm still making these questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I will keep making these questions. You know, like, uh, I, I think what motivates me is actually searching for, you know, the, 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 uh, or bumping into, yes. bumping into things that surprise me, I think. Uh, and of course I'm inspired and I've been, I think and I mentioned that and, and I, I'm really true and I, 
And when I talk with people who work with me at, at with company, especially, it's uh, it's it's beautiful to see how we've grown as people, not only as professionals, right? But you know, the conversations we have, the provocations we make to each other, uh, you know, like being almost like pro uh, pro activists, you know, like questioning things, being critical yes. of, about things, and that makes me well, I think. Cool. Thank you so much, Rui. Thank you for all the participants that kept uh, the entire hour. It was a pleasure. And I hope to see you again soon in another uh, or masterclass or uh, another initiative from LSTM. Uh, the video will be released in the next couple of days. Uh, so stay tuned. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.